thanks Eve for organizing a great symposium. Um, I'll present on the Rocky Inner Title work that I did along with Sean Craig uh, and Andrew Kinziger from Humboldt State, Rosa Lucci with the Tulawa Dene Nation, uh, and Pete Romani from UC Santa Cruz, and Ivano Aiello with Moss Landing Marine Lab. So I'll present on the results from seven of our sites uh, that include three MPAs, um, starting up in the north, Pyramid Point SMCA and Point St. George, which is in uh, Tulawa Dene uh, Ancestral Territory. Palmer's Point, just north of us, um, and then uh, a bunch of states down in Mendocino, Avalo Badaya, which is a creek name uh, in Ten Mile State Marine Reserve, McCarriker, McCarriker SMCA, um, <coughs> a, soy, a site uh, right off the town of Fort Bragg, and then Belinda Point. <coughs> and the project components, um, we worked on sea stars and also uh, with sea star wasting syndrome, we took some data on uh, stars that were dying from that, uh, mussel beds, abalone, sea palm, which is Pistelsia palmiformis, surf grass, um, as well as fish, <coughs> intertidal fish biodiversity surveys, um, and then um, Pete Ramundi's group worked on algae and invertebrate biodiversity surveys, and Ivano Aiello did the high resolution topographic surveys. So I'm just going to focus on some of these components. Um, the methods we use for studying Pisaster um, are based on the Marine, which is the multi-agency rocky intertidal network protocols, um, which use permanently marked irregular plots in the mid to low zone um, that are roughly about 15 to 30 meters squared. Um, they can be challenging to sample when it's wavy. Um, and uh, we had three of those plots per site. And the data we collected on the sea stars were the number, um, um, number of stars, and we binned them by arm length, um, and also took data on wasting category, with zero being healthy stars all the way up to four, uh, and those were basically stars that were disintegrating from the disease. Um, okay. Um, we had, um, Joe, could you speak into the mic a little bit closer? Uh, okay, sorry. Um, this is the, the results from the um, sea star monitoring. Um, the numbers are a little small, but the histogram, it's just a histogram with this being really small stars. These are being uh, 200 millimeter stars, so um, quite big. Um, and the disease class purple being healthy guys, yellow being less, you know, disease class one, all the way up to black, which the, we didn't really see many of those, but some, some of the orange and reds. Um, and so the left is pyramid point in the summer, winter uh, of 2014, and then summer, winter of 2015. Um, and what you can see is that at these two northern sites, pyramid point and point St. George, um, there were actually a fair number of these large uh, sea stars when we started in summer of 2014. But by uh, the winter, uh, the number of those stars had just plummeted. Um, and then the axis here is actually goes only, here goes to, s these first two panels go up to 60, these next two it only goes up to six. So you can see the number of, of stars just dropped. Um, except at Point St. George, this axis jumps up to 150 um, and that's, because way over here in this, this small end of the graph, there are just scads of little sea stars settling. Uh, so we saw really strong pulses of settlement at a few sites, uh, Saint George, Point St. George being one of them. <clears throat> at the southern sites, by the time we started our survey, um, the, the wasting disease, this, the maximum here is five, here is 10, had just pretty much already um, wiped out most of the stars on the benches. Um, and you just don't see much uh, recovery over the, the subsequent three seasons. Um, there's a little bit of a pulse of settlement of small stars here at McCarriker, but um, not, not like it was at Point St. George. Uh, so this shows the, <coughs> the just total numbers um, for all the different sites. The, the rainbow colors range from purple, the coldest at the north, to uh, Belinda Point, the warmest at the south. <coughs> Uh, for orientation, and um, well, you can see I, I had to break the axis to, to show 
these low numbers down here. When we started again, Pyramid Point, Point St. George had a lot, um, but they rapidly, rapidly dropped, and um, there's not really been much recovery in the way of. Oh, so so this is healthy um, stars larger than 60 millimeters, so sort of adult-sized stars. Um, for the small stars, pretty similar pattern, except for this really crazy outlier point, St. George, having really strong pulses of uh, settlement of young stars, uh, and a little bit of that at uh, Palmer's Point. Uh, <clears throat> this is the, the y-axis for this one is the fraction of stars that were symptomatic for the disease. Um, and an interesting pattern, um, we thought there was a slight increase and then maybe a drop in the disease, but then in the last winter time point, you see it, it bounces back up. So it looks like there may be a seasonality to it with, with actually more stars showing disease um, in the winter. <coughs> um, and the, the one sort of outlier here is Belinda Point and the disease prevalence drops, <coughs> but that's because the total abundance of stars dropped and was pretty much zero through the last three data points. So. Um, the patterns with muscles, we took data on percent cover, bed depth, and um, length of individual muscles. And there's not much in the way of patterns. We thought there was maybe a slight increase in bed depth uh, until that last data point in the winter uh, of 2015. And <clears throat> then it dropped. Um, and so that's. That's interesting because we expected, a lot of people expected pretty strong um, release from predation, the, the sea stars being a major predator of the mussels. So it's interesting that there's not um, rapid major uh, rebound of uh, mussels. So just to recap on this work, there were many more Pi's asteroid northern sites in summer 2014, um, but then they rapidly, uh, those numbers rapidly dropped and, and resembled the rest of the, the area with really low abundance. Um, major declines in abundance of large pi disaster. Wasting syndrome, uh, that's, that's not really true. The wasting syndrome prevalence has fluctuated. Uh, it seems to be higher in the winter, but it hasn't really. Um, I needed to update that, sorry. Um, <clears throat> there was a pulse of juvenile pi disaster at two, those two northern sites, especially at Point St. George. Um, and there's not been really marked um, pattern in the change in muscle abundance. Um, there's not been, really been an obvious response to decrease in sea stars. Um, and that may, one idea we had about that might be that we had those two really mellow, well, um, the winter of 2014, 2015 was really uh, not very rough, but then the subsequent winter was. So there, there may be some decrease in muscle bed depth on average because some of the muscles are getting disrupted and, and ripped off the bench by large waves, which happens in the winter here. <clears throat> um, Another interesting part about this uh, project was, I don't know if you guys can make out these guys. Um, those are large abalone in the intertidal, which is really crazy to see because mostly they get um, eaten by people. Um, and that was, that was what we saw at this one site at Fort Bragg, which was a former pulp mill and had been privately held and um, had fences and guards uh, and even did through our study, we had to get special permission. It's decommissioned now. Um, we got permission to go out on the site and were astounded by seeing these um, abalone. So we took some additional data, uh, especially um, uh, with a lot of help from the, the students who were part of the project. And <clears throat> what you can see is that, so the legal size to harvest abalone is these bars and above. And there's still, you know, for the places we were looking, an abalone density of about 0.4 abalones per square meter, which is, that's insane. Um, so, um, but by 2015, um, the word had gotten out that the, pri <clears throat> the property was purchased and, and was turned into public open space and was scheduled to be turned into open space. We got this 2015 survey in, which is the red bars. Blue bars are 2014, um, red is 2015. Um, but you can see in 2015, there's already been a decrease and that's because people were anticipating and it <clears throat> had been um, trespassing onto the property. Uh, and, um, and another signal that it was people is these, of the places we um, did these transects, the higher accessibility sites saw the, the more marked decrease in abundance. 
Um, and again, this is another size on the x-axis, abundance on the y, um, 2014 and 2015. What you can see is that 2015 there's a, a major decrease in abundance and um, and that the, the, one, the one that remains abundant in this larger size class is in these less accessible sites. These shaded sites are the less accessible of the, of the um, areas to be studied. Um, I'm running short on time. I'll rush through this. Uh, we, had, we also, um, the fish work was done by a graduate student, Kevin Hinterman, under Andrew Kinziger. Um, and um, he worked uh, in the summer and winter of both seasons, as, as did we. Um, he also did some rockfish sampling over uh, summer of 2015 to uh, look for settlement, in particular black rockfish. Um, so the way he did it was he picked out some tide pools and permanently marked them, one in each zone at each site. So he had a high, low, and mid um, tide pool at each site. He pumped, <coughs> using a, a gas-powered pump, uh, pumped the water out of the tide pool, and then uh, with the help of folks, grab all the fish and stick them in buckets. Uh, and then he would measure them, uh, identify them to species, and then we'd replace them and refill the tide pool. <coughs> and the results of his work were that there was pretty high diversity, 34 species of <coughs> families. Uh, unsurprisingly, sculpins, the family Cotidae, were most common. Um, there were many juveniles of some of the recreationally fish species. Um, and the, he found that the marine protected area sites that we were in have similar diversity, but lower species richness and lower abundance uh, than the others. Um, and the higher tidal had lower, had lower richness, uh, but similar abundance, mostly uh, a lot of sculpins in those high pools. Uh, and this just shows richness by zone. Um, these lighter green bars are unprotected, and the green bars are the MPAs. And so you can see that the species richness across the high, mid, and low zone is lower in these um, protected areas. And that may just be because of the particular areas that were, were chosen. <coughs> The rockfish work was unfortunately kind of a bust. We saw, um, based on previous work by some of uh, Tim Mill Mulligan students, we would see uh, a lot of, um, Tim students saw hundreds, sometimes thousands of uh, fish and tide pools. Um, and we saw pretty much none. He didn't take data in 2014. But you can see these numbers up to 1,400 at some of these, um, in some of the surveys done by, um, previous students. So uh, that's, that's kind of, it's interesting uh, that that, that um, settlement of these little guys, uh, little black rockfish, wasn't seen. Um, so there are lots of sculpins in the high zone. Nearly all um, likely species, sort of species that are in the intertidal in this part of the coast were observed in this study. Um, these MPA, the particular MPA sites that were chosen uh, seem to have lower species richness and abundance. Um, and it's kind of a mystery why there were no black rockfish. They're potentially poor recruitment years um, with anomalous warm ocean conditions, but I think the dive surveys saw fair numbers of, of black rockfish uh, juveniles, so that's, it's, it's interesting, something to think about with the integration. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank all the undergrads who've helped out, uh, HSU colleagues, funders and partners, and I forgot to write JTEC on here, Rosa, so sorry JTEC. I should have put you on here, man. <laughs> um, but that's it.